afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our uh, post-European Parliament elections 2019 review. A very special thanks to Lorenzo, without whom this wouldn't have happened. Uh, I see my name is on as a coordinator, but that's simply untrue. Uh, I'm just looking at the order of speakers as we, uh, as we speak. But I think it's really important that we take a, a temperature of what these elections uh, already mean, what they might mean in the future, uh, as uh, they were, firstly, turn up was up, uh, turnout was up, which is very important. I think the breaking of the duopoly of the uh, socialists and the EPP is very healthy. And I'm very struck that it's being framed as fragmentation and as a problem. I think it will make, it's really damaging to the European Parliament that since 1979, broadly with a, just a very short interlude when there was an ALDE president, that really the two big parties, groupings have dominated this. So I think that's actually very healthy and is much more representative, clearly, of how Europeans uh, feel. Uh, it means that coalition building and Council and Parliament can come to agreement by the next European Council in June, but they will certainly, uh, they will certainly try. And then I think another interesting phenomenon was that although the radical right did well in this country, they did less well elsewhere across, uh, elsewhere across Europe. And already those elections have had immediate political consequence. Uh, we've had, uh, immediately it meant, uh, it led to uh, an election in Greece. It could well destabilize the coalitions in other countries uh, and uh, I don't think one can say that the collapse of the Austrian government was related to the European Parliament elections. It had a rather, it had another source. So I'd like to thank all of our speakers uh, today and let's start and let's have a lively, uh, a lively discussion. Great to see everyone here. So we start with Hans Peter. First introductory remark is that we actually should differentiate by country because, yes. because uh, these elections were uh, a lot reacting to national politics. So the outcome was quite different according to the country. Having said this, I make five remarks which are general. Try to generalize and maybe it, within the general points uh, make some differentiation. So the first is increasing turnout. That is certainly uh, very important because it changed a trend that had been ongoing until the last uh, European elections. And I, I looked here at the different countries. It, it, uh, the participation increased most in Spain, in Romania, and uh, also in Germany. In Germany, participation increased by more than 10%. And, and uh, as I like to say, if voters have an alternative, then they go voting. And, and uh, the presence of these unsympathetic nationalist populist parties provides an alternative to some voters, and that's why participation increases. But this has also the implication that the outcome of the elections is more legitimate than it used to be. Second point, the decline of the mainstream parties of centre-left and centre-right, you already mentioned it. Uh, the decline was more severe on the centre-left. Uh, in uh, some countries, the centre-left uh, is down to historic lows, especially in Germany. And uh, I, I listened to the, the German 8 o'clock news on Sunday evening. The only thing they talked about was Germany. And uh, the, the most important thing they talked about was the decline of uh, the Social Democrats. Then in Italy, they have 22% now. Last time, Renzi's uh, apotheose was 40%. Uh, in France, they collapsed totally. They, although if you count all the fragments of the left, it's also still about 20%. 
In some countries, we have seen a recovery of the centre-left against the trend in the Netherlands, for example. Uh, in uh, Denmark, uh, the Social Democrats, uh, they get 24%, but they are the strongest party. In Spain, they get 33%. Then my third point, who, who benefited? Uh, the rise of the nationalists, the Greens and the Liberals. The nationalists first. Uh, everybody expected them to rise and they rose, but not as spectacularly as it was except, expected. So the hype might have been somewhat exaggerated. Uh, they rose in Italy. I mean, Italy is the odd man out here. Uh, the Lega gets 34% and Fratelli d'Italia gets another 6.5. So they, they are really uh, impressively present. Uh, the Cinque Stelle, on the other hand, declined, <laughs> got halved. Uh, in Germany, they got about what they had, 10%. In France, they got 23%, but uh, they had 20 some odds percent before. In Austria, I was struck by the fact that they didn't pay more dearly for the events a week earlier. They were elected as if nothing had happened. Uh, on the other hand, in Denmark, they were halved. And in Romania, where the functional equivalent to the nationalist populist right is uh, the former communist party, it lost half of its vote it was down from 45% to 23%. So there are some Eastern European countries which are quite different from uh, Poland and Hungary where the leading parties indeed got even reinforced. But in Hungary, Jobbik, on the other hand, was destroyed. So uh, even in Hungary, something is changing. And then the other parties which gained were the Greens. In Germany, the Greens make 20%. They are now the second largest party in Germany. And uh, the Liberals, La République en Marche, uh, but also the British Liberals, the Romanian National Liberals increased their vote uh, importantly. My uh, fourth point overall, what does that up, add up to? Uh, Bridget said fragmentation, and you said it's not so bad that the party system fragments. What is uh, happening is, and that's why I put this graph here, that we generally distinguish between old and new conflicts, and the old conflicts are the conflicts of religion and class, which oppose, on the one hand, uh, social Democrats, on the, uh, the other hand, Christian Democrats, uh, conservative liberals, uh, these kind of uh, center-right parties. And the, this conflict has been uh, less uh, successful or se less successfully mobilized in these elections to the detriment of the other conflict uh, which opposes cosmopolitans to nationalists that my neighbor to the right talks about the transnational cleavage or it was once Galtan. Uh, in our case, we talk about the demarcation integration cleavage. Uh, uh, Simon Bongier talks about universalism versus uh, parochialism. Uh, others talk about communitarianism, Zürn and uh, his uh, co-authors, communitarianism versus cosmopolitanism. So this kind of conflict has been reinforced. On the one hand, the Greens, on the other hand, the nationalists. And this kind of conflict is actually properly situated at the European level. You could argue that European politics is precisely about this conflict, about uh, uh, integration, uh, uh, increasing integration versus uh, nationalist demarcation. And now, it's about 25% on each corner. It's, it's about evenly balanced the political importance of, of the two conflicts. The pro-European forces are the old mainstream parties plus the Greens. Where are the, 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 the Liberals, the Liberal Democrats? They are about in the center with respect to the old conflict, but they are on the cosmopolitan side, and that's the same for La République en Marche. 
So you have the Social Democrats, the Christian Democrats, the Liberals and the Greens, and on the other hand, you have the Nationalists, which get 25%. It's more than they got before, but it's a minority, a clear minority. My last point is about coalition formation. Bridget also already mentioned it. The Nationalists, who, got, who get only 25%, they are deeply divided internally, and uh, they have difficulties get their act together because they have national priorities, which by definition are in contrast, uh, in conflict with other national priorities. Just take the refugee issue as an example. Salvini wants them distributed in, our, in Europe, and, and Orban, of course, doesn't. And then the pro-Europeans, they are divided uh, into four camps which uh, were only two before, the two no longer are majoritarian, they cannot make a coalition together, but uh, there are different options for a coalition, mm -hmm. and we are, I, I share your confidence, we can be quite confident that one of these coalitions will be formed. Uh, among all the points I had together, um, um, Bridget and, and Hans Peter have, have taken almost all of the points I wanted to make. <laughs> so I, 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 I won't probably speak for uh, 10 minutes, I will speak less. Uh, I would like to start with a general remark, which is that we, we are, <clears throat> as it was also evident from Hans Peter's talk, we are to some extent, we, we are driven to think about generaliz generalities and generalizations and making, like we think of the European elections as European elections, and hence we try to extract some general um, conclusions. It is quite uh, a different matter to what extent uh, voters themselves look at these elections as general elections. And I have a, a small anecdote here. I am very happy back at the UI when uh, European elections happen. I think of them, I kind of experience them more vividly uh, here. Um, on Sunday, I, w there was a bit of a, of a festival at home because my wife is, is French, so we had one laptop with the French um, uh, TV uh, discussing the, the elections. On the other laptop, the, the Greek TV discussing the elections and, uh, and the Italian elections, the Italian on TV, we had the Italian elections. Uh, I calculated how much time it took, not for the voters, not for the uh, for, the, for, for the people in general, but actually for the elites, for the politicians and the, and the journalists to talk about any other country. <clears throat> this goes again the European election. Uh, it took the French program around two hours to s start talking about someone else. It took Italians more than, more than three hours to start speaking, to start speaking <laughs> about, <laughs> others, about others. And it took the Greek, uh, the first time the Greeks uh, went and said, let's see what the others are saying only after the Prime Minister declared the elections. And the, way, the reason they said it is because let's see how the others have responded to the Prime Minister's, to the Prime Minister's um, sort of a call for, for, for early elections. Which kind of, you know, I think is, is, is of course anecdotal, but it makes the point that, that this, again, struggles to become a common European uh, concern. Now, if I can have, I will stand just for a second in order to, to, to put a graph here. I, I had it, just one second. <coughs> now, um, this is one of the elections in which I think, uh, and maybe for some of you that know uh, uh, what I do for a living, that I think quantitative approach is not extremely useful in telling us anything about, about this election. And let me say why. Uh, a common pattern with um, European elections, which makes them being also known as second order elections, is that precisely because they are not about Europe so much, and, and internally what happens is that they, 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 they behave or voters behave as if they were uh, mid-term elections. W and how do voters behave in mid-term elections? But basically, they uh, punish the incumbent, or generally, they punish the small governments, the, 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 part, the, gov the parties uh, in the small or a junior or, 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 or senior coalition um, members. And this is what happened all, all in all, on, a on, on the whole, also in this election. So in this election, you see two curves. Um, these curves denote uh, opposition and government parties, the main ones, and, and you see that 
uh, there is a decline of um, of, of, of in a way of, of, of the electoral uh, coalition partners uh, in terms of the votes compared to the previous national elections. And that again is something that we see happening pretty much uh, every time we have a European election. As a result of this, there are even some interesting side effects of these elections that have now been to some extent spotted in, in, in the literature. And if Bridget can help me to go to the next, uh, to the next slide, which is just clicking the right, exactly. So this is, uh, what, 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 what are we showing here? See, here you see actually research coming from Hans Peter's uh, student, who also was my student, uh, master student at Oxford, uh, uh, Julia schulte -Klos. Uh And Julia's, what started as a master thesis, ended up as one chapter in her uh, PhD thesis, is a paper now published at the European Union Politics, which shows the first order effects of second order elections. In other words, the implications of the Europe, of the fact that of an election that we think is very uh, non-consequential, the very consequential effects of this in the national arena. What happens practically is that you have uh, momentum being driven, being generated as a result of the electoral of the European elections, and as a result, you have this uh, momentum being uh, sort of mapped into the national electoral arena. And what you see here is how strongly this map is according to the electoral cycle. In other words, according to how close the national and the, Euro and the European elections uh, come. And as a result of this, you have two, two, two kinds of outcomes that are important. One that Julia looks, which is the increase and the, and the, and the rise of the radical right. And again, the anecdote here could be France, National Front emerges only after a successful 1984 um, uh, electoral result in the European elections. Second order elections generating first order effects in the national arena by creating momentum. And if you now can uh, go to the next one. Yes, basically what this shows is how um, the effect of the European election, in a way, how how well a radical right party will do in a European election, how well it will do in the next uh, national election, according to where this national election is with respect to the European election. Or according, if you want, to how to where the, the European election is, is, is situated in the, in the electoral cycle. In other words, either in the beginning or at the very end, when these two things are together, are close it, clo one or, uh, precedes the other. And, uh, and that's about radical right. If, if we can go to the next, uh, to the next. May I, may I try? <laughs> Usually one thinks that the second order European elections are influenced by national elections. She re reverses the optic. So she tries to show that the European elections have an impact on national elections. And the. Yes, is a predictor, and the idea is the closer in time, that's why it's quadratic, the closer in time the European elections are to the national elections, the more impact they have on the national elections. Because just about impact, if, we, if, you, if you can go to the next one, here you actually see impact. Uh, this is identified, this is, um, I mean, I'm talking to the economists here. This is the effect of, of, of voting, uh, of being first eligible in a European version national election. You cannot choose whether your first eligible vote will be a vote for a national or a European election. So it so happens that when it is uh, a European election, then later in your life you're more likely to vote for small parties. Okay, so what you see here is basically uh, according to the electoral cycle again, and where the, electoral, where the European election is, is uh, situated with respect to the national election, people who were at some point in their first eligible vote, eligible to vote in a European rather than a, a, a national election, are way more likely to vote for uh, a small party, not necessarily a radical right, it can be the Greens. Now, in comparative political behavior, these by now are kind of well-established sort of patterns. In other words, we know that there is a second order uh, sort of characteristics of the European elections. We know that they leave an imprint on national election electoral arenas. We know that this can be, can be actually quite long term. And I think this is all captured to some extent in the, in the first uh, graph that we show that kind of the same practical, uh, the same general picture emerges. Uh, yet there are some exceptions, which I think are notable, and they call for a reverse, as we call it, 
um, sort of long-term effect. And I wanted to go to the, to the very last, uh, basically, slide, which is the, um, the, the exceptions. It is the first time, I think, where we, see, we start seeing consolidating rather than party fragmentation effects of, 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 of European elections. Let me give you an example. The, the last election in Spain, the national election in Spain, generated a, a two kind of new um, uh, sort of facts. One was the, 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 the rebounding of, of the social democrats, of the socialists, and the other one was the, the new radical right. The European election has completely consolidated this. It, in, it decreased fragmentation by making the Podemos now, you know, by basically working as a way, as a signal for people to coordinate. Now, voters on that side can go to the, so, to the socialist, hence you have an increase in the socialists and a decline in the Podemos, and also there is some coordination taking place in the right. So if anything, if we were to measure fragmentation between the two elections, it would be even, if anything, even lower in, in, in European elections, given, of course, uh, El Sequel. The same happens in Italy. For, for everyone who lives in Italy, we know that the trend was towards this direction. The European election helps to, co to consolidate exactly this new two-partism, with the two parties now being back again to the Partido Democratico, probably, gradually, but most importantly, a new uh, competitor arising among, the, among the, the right side of the ideological spectrum, which is, uh, which is the Lega. In other words, there is consolidation more there than fragmentation. And the same happened in Greece. And in Greece it happened in a way that also precisely because of the fact that, uh, that there was so long since the previous national election, it, it also because for whatever reason the, the government um, uh, sort of thought of this as a referendum for their own uh, tenure, it ended up with uh, the call for early, for early elections. But this is something that Again, is, is, is interesting because it makes European elections important, I think, and that is uh, a new, I think, a, 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 in a new way, in a way that we hadn't seen before. Not via long-term effects of how we vote in an unpoliticized environment or how we only lo listen to the extremes talking about and campaigning about an otherwise an interesting election because it is not about the executive. There is no executive related to the European Parliament, at least according to the minds of voters. Rather, it is an election that is important precisely because it helps us consolidate uh, general trends and speaks to the national elections uh, in a way that is much more as equals uh, compared to the past. And with that, I'll stop. Has been, uh, uh, it has been developed uh, and framed uh, uh, in different countries. Uh, 
from this point of view, there is a high variation among countries, uh, even from the perspective of uh, political communication. Of course, the environment, uh, which has been one of the main topics which has been communicated more on the European frame than on the national frame, even due to uh, Fridays for Future marches uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and the, uh, the, the, the consequences uh, that it had also uh, in the media perspective. And then there is the question of the rise of the populist parties. Uh, it seemed uh, that it was a, f a political communication based on a self-fulfilling prophecy. In the end, it was not, or at least not as uh, so high as uh, everybody was talking about. And we can ask ourselves here in, uh, uh, at the first stage, was this uh, polarization, uh, was this uh, uh, prognosis uh, that the, 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 the European uh, radical uh, populist parties uh, would uh, increase so much uh, in the voters of the European electorate uh, kind uh, of an explanation for the higher turnout? Uh, or can we ha do we have to find different explanations, uh, even in terms of political communication? I think that this is one important question uh, for the next uh, uh, researches. Uh, and then, going back uh, to the first point which has been uh, raised, uh, the question of political fragmentation. Everybody was talking about the fact that uh, mainstream parties would lose uh, uh, the majorities uh, together and there would be another a a phenomenon of fragmentation. Also, this fragmentation uh, in the European Parliament uh, was uh, uh, communicated uh, in uh, like preoccupation terms. Uh, uh, and. Uh, this is also kind uh, of uh, uh, effect uh, uh, that helped maybe uh, uh, grow an interest uh, in European uh, uh, questions and then the question of uh, welfare and austerity. So from this point of view, we can talk of, of an increasing interest uh, in European matters and issues uh, uh, as a whole, but we know that on the other side, all these issues uh, were covered, uh, taking into consideration the national perspectives much more uh, than uh, uh, the European perspectives. Uh, and this is uh, uh, due, of course, uh, to the sensitiveness uh, of the issues uh, uh, that were on the table. Uh, maybe uh, the, the Brexit issues was uh, uh, considered uh, from a more comparative point of view, but of course, uh, immigration issues made reference uh, to Europe only when Europe was considered as the environment where decisions should have been taken and respected. But even there are variations among countries uh, that have to do with the centrality of one or other issues uh, uh, like uh, um, that, I, uh, that I put in, the, in, this, in this slide. The second issue, the second question is, did the political campaigning for the 2019 election differ considerably from national election in its main features? And then here I go to the, uh, the, the most consolidated research on political communication and its main features. Uh, there were many attempts to make European elections attractive, and how? I think that had, there has been an implicit coordination uh, among the European uh, political actors based on dramatization, polarization, the rise, of, the rise of the radical right front. It is interesting also how the language uh, uh, really underlined this polarization. We have been talking a lot about the front of uh, uh, populist right parties, the front of mainstream parties, uh, like uh, the, 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 uh, the explanation and the, the, the description of this uh, uh, of this political campaign was very much based uh, on the horse race effect. Uh, the war on surveys, uh, Brexit race against time. So there was again an horse race effect and the dramatization and the personalization and leadership effect. And the, the attempt uh, to focus uh, on the issue of, for, for example, Spitzenkandidaten did work but did not work entirely in order to create a real Europeanization of the political communication. And then we have to take into account a kind of a spectacularization. The Ibiza case, uh, of course, uh, how, uh, uh, how the FPÖ was, uh, uh, was, uh, was uh, uh, affected by the uh, Ibiza case uh, and the representation of the failed practice as, like as a theater piece. Uh, and uh, there was also spectacularization in reporting about uh, the meeting in Milan about the, uh, uh, the radical right populist parties uh, and the symbols uh, that have been made use uh, in this occasion. Uh, it's not a case that they put here the picture of Salvini with the crucifix uh, and uh, that was mu very much debated. But there is also an attempt to make, uh, to bring European citizens in 
through the voting advice systems. Uh, we all know there are many, and the European, and the Euro European Institute uh, is one of the front runners of this new frontier for, uh, uh, for, for regaining attention in European uh, issues uh, through voting advice systems. Uh, but there are, there are also campaigns to sit, stimulate the citizens' interest uh, in European issues. Uh, and I think that will be very important in the future. Uh, last thing, uh, we're witnessing a new model for European campaigning. Uh, here it is useful uh, uh, to make reference uh, to this kind of Europeanization, uh, taking into account the political communication. The first one is a vertical Europeanization of, po of uh, a political communication. This is a study made by uh, the Osservatorio uh, of a com Political Communication of the University of Turin. And there is an horizontal Europeanization that connects connections among member states with regards to European issues. Uh, just uh, a very, very brief uh, uh, focus uh, on, uh, uh, on Italy, and then we can go more in detail during the discussion. We can see here from this slide that the Europeanization, even if from the vertical and from the horizontal part, uh, uh, perspectives, is low. It, it means, and it really uh, states uh, that, uh, um, in, that um, national issues uh, are important, the European issues are important too, but even talking about European issues, uh, it's the national perspective that uh, uh, emerges uh, as the most important. There will be time in the future for comparing these uh, results uh, with uh, similar results uh, of research that are being carrying, carried out uh, in other European countries, uh, like it has been made in the 2014 elections. Another, and the last thing, uh, traditional media, social media, we have been talking a, lo a lot about uh, the impact uh, of, uh, of the use of the social media with regards to the mobilization effect of uh, uh, um, radical populist parties. And uh, sure, there are many researches. Uh, for example, there is a very good recent one about the use of uh, social media by the AfD in, in Germany uh, that, that states that they are particularly good uh, in uh, mobilizing uh, citizens uh, on, uh, uh, on, uh, on, uh, on social media. On the other side, uh, there has been at least two cases uh, that would, I would like to put at your attention. The first case is, of course, the Ibiza case uh, here you can see how the centrality of traditional media strategy is important. It's not a case that this video that was shot two, two years ago was uh, reproduced right now, to, to, uh, um, let's say uh, one week before the elections. Uh, so this is a strategy in how to use the political communication made by traditional media because it was a German, uh, uh, a German uh, uh, newspaper that uh, uh, published uh, this uh, uh, first, uh, this, uh, uh, this video. So from from this point of view, we can see a traditional st strategy, and then there is a case. I don't know if you heard about it. Uh, it's this uh, young YouTuber uh, made uh, a YouTube a video, uh, published a, a video on YouTube. It is uh, quite nearly one hour long, and it was looked at by 10 uh, million people in a few days. And it's the representation with quotations uh, from the literature and from, uh, uh, from journalists uh, of how the CDU, how the, the, the Christian Democratic Party in Germany, destroys uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the idea of social equality, of uh, environment, uh, also making reference uh, to the SPD and to the AfD, but particularly focused uh, on uh, the CDU. And the reactions uh, of uh, uh, the CDU were particularly uh, difficult, let's say. Uh, they were late, uh, and even yesterday, uh, the secretary of uh, the leader of, uh, the, uh, of the CDU made uh, some uh, uh, bad statements uh, or some wrong statements, uh, uh, or at least perceived like that about, uh, uh, about uh, uh, this case. So, to conclude, what's next? European elections are still second order elections, uh, but they are more and more dependent on the permanent campaign climate uh, that uh, is developing uh, uh, since, uh, since decades uh, in, the national, uh, uh, in the national context, but also uh, uh, have an impact on the European context. Future of national elections characterize uh, the European campaigning, and from a theoretical point of view, parties and communication actors seem to follow and stimulate 
the main actor cognitive shortcuts. Leader effect, and here again, there is a high variation among country. Issue voting, if you think <laughs> even of, uh, uh, of uh, the rise of the Greens had, uh, that has been already uh, cited, uh, quoted uh, in, uh, in Germany and elsewhere, and negative identification. Do not vote for radical, part, radical populist parties. They, are, they can be very dangerous for the future of Europe. Uh, and uh, the, 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 the symbols, the use of symbols is also uh, something that uh, uh, really uh, is useful in order to understand this campaign. In the future, I think that uh, we should uh, focus not only on uh, political campaigning, advertising and campaigning during the months before the European elections, but take a look at what is, uh, in my opinion, happening uh, at the European Union level, like uh, this double phenomenon of talking about uh, uh, European elections in the moment when we, European elections are held, but I see that, that there is some investments uh, in uh, uh, developing uh, a European communication based uh, on campaigns uh, directed to citizens uh, even outside uh, the electoral campaign. Thank you. Thank you very much. on changing structure of, of political conflict in Europe at large. So I'm going to take a more structural or, say, sociological approach a bit on public opinion voting as well as party politics. So I'm going to start with an argument, then I'm going to show you a picture on the EP elections, uh, some EP trends, and then back to our work to give you some evidence, and then I'm going to land into my very bad country called Flanders. <laughs> That's been a really bad, naughty boy. Um, okay, let's go to the first, so it's here, I think, yeah. The point of departure is rising volatility. There's no denying there, and the reasons for it are also very well known. It's the decline of class politics or the old cleavages in a Stan Rockan, a Lipset Rockanian frame that predicted voting uh, relatively reliably um, until a few decades ago. So that has lost trax traction. The reasons for that erosion are also pretty well known and in many ways overdetermined. Uh, industrialization uh, declining, um, etc. What is more contested is what is replacing it. Is this uh, rising volatility a thing that we're going to have to live with in the future, or is this something more transient? And so here is where we take a position that it's a more tra it's not necessarily totally transient. It's not necessarily totally permanent. It's somewhere in between. But in the sense there is, while there is destructuration going on and probably continue, will continue for some time, there is at the same time a process of restructuration. That is, a subset of voters are <coughs> getting um, more firmly attached to certain political preferences and hunting for parties that are willing to echo or reinforce those preferences. So there's both going on, but essentially what you're getting is a rise of a new cleavage. Hans Peter has already done the PR for me there, which we call the transnational cleavage. And why do we do it? I've got some words there, the first line. Um, if you Thinking about what the sources might be, you could go back to what has replaced industrialization. It's, we call it here the information technology revolution. It's a post-industrial shift to post-industrial employment that has empowered some sectors of the economy, people <coughs> like us, and, um, and disempowered others, including the organizations that used to represent them particularly the manual workers and the trade unions. And that's a process that started 
60s, certainly in the 70s, 80s, is ongoing, and that has then also fused into, infused into a globalization process or a transnationalization process that has many features. Increase in trade, about 50% increase over the past few decades, that's not nothing. Increase in mobility, increase in, in, in institutionalization of international politics, stronger international organizations, and of course, first and foremost, a transformation of, of the European Union in that respect. That has shifted the cards uh, profoundly for subsets of voters, significant subsets of voters, but we're not arguing the entire electorate being equally affected by this. So what this leads to, or what we then anticipate, is left-right politics, the traditional politics declining, and issues around that transnational cleavage, which are much more culturally tinged. There is an economic base, but there's a strong, there's st strong cultural implications there rising. So we call it Galtan, green alternative libertarian, traditionalist authoritarian nationalism. The core word there is probably national, and that's why we now speak of a transnational cleavage. The, the for or against national, the national state and its traditional institutions as a protector for what once was a predictable lifestyle or for a, a more open-minded set of um, mindset as well as set of institutions that, that, that creates opportunities for the more mobile amongst us. So Galtan preferences we expect to be social, to become increasingly socially structured. And I'm saying this is a process of a process. It's a process in process. So we're at the beginning, I think, of this. Not in the middle and certainly at the end. We're not at the time of consolidation yet. But if you see social structuring, restructuring, it's going to be around Galtan issues, people who care about these issues, and the parties that represent voice these issues. And second, because this is very much generationally driven, younger generations are much more affected by these transformative changes in the economy, society, and international arena, you'd expect this to, to lead to polarization among younger voters. Not younger voters embracing one side, not the other side, but rather polarization both sides. Now I'm going to show you some trends, and I'm just stealing this for, from um, the Financial Times, who did my work, which did my work for me. Three, three key graphs. They actually had five, but I'm showing you just three. The one on the um, fragmentation has been mentioned. Centrist parties lose their majority. That's the one on the top right for you there. Um, that's the first. Second is polarization. Green parties win, in some countries win big, and break through beyond Northwestern Europe, and that's the larger inset you see there. And so does the radical right. The FT didn't give me a nice picture about the radical right, but you can kind of see it a bit at the bottom then. Third one, containment of the nationalists, which I think is overstating a bit uh, here in this graph, because the nationalists here are confined to the, the traditional blocks, but of course, there is a strong sovereigntist trend among the GUE, and the ERC group is, is also quite mixed in terms of where it stands on the issue of Europe. But I think these are interesting graphs. But underneath all this, what really was striking when you're listening to the election reporting, um, a lot of the framing was in terms of this cultural cleavage. Galtan, transnational cleavage, cosmopolitan, parochial, there's, there's different ways of talking about it. It was around this and not around left, right. Now, back to my little, <coughs> a little bit of facts here to research. What's going on? We argue, as I said, that the emergence of a new cleavage is at the beginning. Um, and what you see here on the, on the left is a table which shows the overrepresentation or the underrepresentation of People with particular social characteristics, education, occupation, urban, rural, gender, right, for the party families. This is across 14 countries in Europe, both East and West. This is based on ESS data, several waves, so the seven waves that we currently have. So, for example, if you look at the education 
column there, what you're seeing is that the higher educated, this is post-secondary and tertiary education, are heavily overrepresented relative to the overall electorate. While on the flip side, the TAN parties or the radical nationalist parties, there you see a, a significant underrepresentation of this group. And as you see, green and TAN, <coughs> or gal and tan, if I were to be consistent in my use of language, um, stand at, at the poles of this. And you can go for each of these characteristics, this is bivariate, and you see that except for urban-rural, which is a partial exception, green and tan are the most extreme uh, in terms of most deviant from the, the uh, general electorate in terms of these social characteristics. These little pictures on the right hand side, you know, give you a sense of it. The darker the line and the thicker the line, the more uh, different the electorates are, the, the group of voters that vote for a particular party family. So that's one. So you see some structuring happening. It's certainly, and, and when you look at the, the traditional, the conventional left-right parties, and that includes the radical left, they actually hardly differ from one another, including on occupation, which used to be the main <coughs> differentiating feature on the left right. right. The other thing, and this is a bit complicated, so I'm gonna cut to the chase here. Um, the structuring effect of education by cohort, this is a multinomial logic. Essentially, this is the, the education is a more powerful um, structuring factor is more powerful in explaining whether you're going to vote for green and tan parties um, than it is for left and right parties. The lines are steeper for green and tan parties. You see here the, the X line takes from primary education all the way up to tertiary education. So it's a, again ESS voting. But what I really want to emphasize here is the light blue lines. Look at the light blue lines in the top two graphs there for green parties and for tan parties, they are steeper than they are, quite a bit steeper than they are for the, the other lines. The light blue lines are the people who are born after 1970. The darkest line is the people born before 1950 and the one and then in between. So the structuring effect, the kind of education, the extent of the education you've had is more powerful, for, much more powerful for the younger than it is for the for the older people. And the reverse is the case for the mainstream left and the mainstream right parties. Okay, now I'm going to back to my bad, not back, forward to my bad country, Flanders. You know, which was bad because it's, it's, it's been a country where against some of the other trends, the nationalists have not been contained. In fact, they've made a major comeback in the form of the Flams Belang. Uh, which is in the Salvini group, right? And there's a kind of a tripling of its support uh, since uh, compared to 2014. So you see there in the table, the percentage in the country as a whole that underestimates, of course, the Flams Belang, which doesn't run in, in the southern part, in the French-speaking part of the country. It only runs in Flanders, translated in the in proportion of the Flemish vote, that's 18.5%, which, by the way, thanks for small mercies, is not its record. In 2004, it had close to 25%. And at that point, the party was actually even browner <coughs> than it is now in terms of its language. It was openly, openly anti-immigrant, openly almost racist, really. So that's, that's one thing that I want you to, to see there, Flams Belang. But also the Greens have gained significantly less than had anticipated in the public opinion polls, but it's the same kind of story of polarization that we have seen generally in the European elections. The second, and therefore I have these graphs there, there's a sharp territorial pattern emerging, and it, this actually doesn't even show it entirely yellow. The bright yellow is Flams Blanc, by the way. Green, obviously, is, is the Green Party, and for some reason, the green areas in Flanders have turned gray on this particular map. I had no control over that. It's a map stolen from the Standard, uh, one of the main uh, newspapers in, in Flanders. So, so gray is actually green in Flanders, right? But the territorial pattern is uh, very interesting, and people talk about it now in the media. Um, the Flams Belang started as a party that had its base 
in the cities 15 years ago among manual workers, discontented, and also a, a history with the past of, of uh, Flemish collaboration during World War II, but that's a different story. The, right now, the Flams Belong has its strongholds in the suburban and, uh, and, and rural areas, and that's what you see, for example, on the left there, West Flanders, which is um, more farms than anything else to be had, um, is now a stronghold for the Flams Belang. The cities have turned green. Some in major ways, in Ghent, which is the second largest city in Flanders, that gray spot that you have there, it's the first party. In Brussels, it's the first party. And you're talking about 25% and more of the vote. Right, so there's a, a, a real territorial or lay, layering to, to the support for uh, the two sides of this cultural divide. Thirdly, um, I've got this little thing on the Flemish parliament there. The territorial patterns are slightly different, but let me say that in terms of percentage of the vote, right, I mean the Belgian election, I should say, the elections in Belgium were the so-called monster elections, where there were elections simultaneously for the regional parliaments, the national parliaments, and the European parliaments. When you look at the percentage of support, there's very little shifting going on, So, which is, suggests that for, you know, there's not much of second order voting going on. There is shifting at the individual level, which is why you see slightly different territorial pattern, but not in terms of the aggregate level of support for either the Flams Belang or the Green parties um, on, the, on the ends, on the bookends of, of this new cleavage. Um, I'm almost done. I just wanted to give you a taste of, of how people are talking about that on the Left at the top, this picture is um, of a, a man in Dick's Murder, who, which is a small town, smallish town in West Flanders, the western part where you saw all that green. Um, and you can read the quote there. Um, but what, what you have there is worldviews colliding with a new daily experiences. And sometimes we underestimate the power of daily experiences, the experiment, experiential component in what drives voting behavior. Um, this West Flanders, for all its rurality, actually has uh, it felt the impact of the migration crisis. This is the first election after the migration crisis, right? Uh, in terms of migrants living and traveling through, often traveling through to try to get to, to Calais to take, uh, to somehow make it to the UK. So one of these transit routes runs through that part of Flanders. There's uh, issues of uh, security there as well. And then there's the cultural. I mean, this person is referring to someone with a burqa essentially, right? Um, and, and that kind of, I think we sometimes ignored the importance of experiences in shaping people's views. There is the literature that says that the rise of the radical right or the anti-immigrant parties is not a response to actual changes in immigration. And at a certain sufficiently high level, that is the case. But I think we might have looked often at a level of aggregation that's too high, in part because our data don't, below, don't allow us to travel lower. Right? And so at the very local level, things might happen. There's a lot of local variation and support for the radical right, um, in this case of Flams Belang, that may also be partly explained by um, the, the actual local experience that differs from town to town, from, from uh, village to village. Um, there is interesting work by Jeremy Ferreira, who's done uh, some uh, experimental, not um, actually some panel data in Germany, oversampling in, uh, you know, just, just monitoring changes in political attitudes and political behavior during the migration crisis. And, and so from 2015 to 2018, that seems to uh, uh, corroborate some of this as well. The second message and the last message here is youth and gender polarize. Um, the Flams Belang is very much a, a party of the young men it was actually among people who between 12 young men and boys between 12 and 30 and 24 years old, it was the first party of choice according to pu public opinion polls. Of course, a lot of these people haven't voted yet, but it probably means that there's more to come. Um, women 
and girls <coughs> tend to veer far more to, to, to the green sense. So there is a lot um, there that seems to corroborate what, what we anticipate, you know, uh, uh, extrapolating from data that are, that are older but and probably softer than what uh, is been expiring in, this, in these elections. This is now really my last slide. I couldn't resist this. Champions of framing. Parties are not passive, of course. They are active agents, and, and uh, Georgia has, has taken us there. But what is striking uh, is that the party that's been absolutely brilliant in using Facebook is the Flams block. And, you know, it, they've thrown 400,000 euros at it. You can buy an awful lot of votes, it looks like for 400,000 euros. And by the way, Bart Stas, the guy who is actually behind, uh, who is the planner there, uh, says that he, he um, observed very closely the Trump campaign and the Brexit campaign and took and drew lessons from it. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. Uh, thank you all very much for wonderful uh, input and insight. I'm very struck that, uh, Hans Peter, you, you defined the demarcation integration as conflict, and you define it as a cleavage. And I'm wondering where we are in the conflict cleavage space. But that's we'll we'll go to the uh, we'll go to the audience now. So please, who would like to ask questions? Sure. Start. Thank you. Thank you. All, all that's very interesting. I I'd like to start with the participation rate because this is this is a major. Uh, new feature of this election, that we, we saw the rise of the participation rate. That's actually very good news. The question is, why are we seeing it? So do we have, uh, do we have some evidence? Because we, I mean, in, in what you said, there were several potential explanations uh, offered. One is a sort of transnationalization process, that's, you know, the, it's becoming more, more transnational. One is that the voters were offered a broader uh, choice, a broader alternative. Um, one is that there was more at stake in this European parliamentary election, so, so that's a very rational behavior, you know, there's more at stake in terms of uh, uh, issues voters care about, and they perceive that these issues are going to be decided upon at European level, be it migration, be it climate, you know, being uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the rise of uh, hostile powers and the uh, Europe in the world. And finally, it was even suggested that by nature, these European uh, elections are closer to a proportional representation than national elections, so that it gives... Uh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, so that um, there was... A, sorry? That well, that's always, a, right? yes, but that, yeah, I mean, there, was, there was a sort of increasing demand for, for diversity in the, uh, in, in, in the offer and that there was a, a more of a channel for it than in national uh, election. So, I mean, we have many potential explanations, but perhaps we, we know something Plus about... Plus one more that in some countries you had regional and local elections at the same time. Yeah, right? but that's probably always the case, that you have Not a coincidence. Well, perhaps some, some uh, you know, I mean particular factor that has nothing to do with. So um, do we know, uh, do, do we actually know something about who uh, voted more? I mean, in terms of uh, age, gender, uh, po political preferences, etc. Can I very quickly? I mean, we don't really have, the only data we have is country level. We know Poland has biggest increase in turnout, um, like by more than 20% increase in turnout. Now the next country is Spain and that I think um, confirms George's point that um, you know in Spain you also have the municipal and communal and regional elections together. Uh, it is unclear. I mean, the elect, you know, in the, there have been some countries in which that was the highest ever turnout. That's one third of the countries, but there is one third of the countries in which this is not the highest ever EP turnout, and there is a small one fifth of countries where there was even a decline. Some Portugal, some Italy was one of those cases. Eight percent increase. Yeah, eight percent increase is important, but but in the in the grand scheme of things, I, I think 
we should see with with the perspective. I understand that. I, I, let's. I would wait to see to have more data points to see how much this is structural and how much is this not just some sort of regression to the mean. Yes, because you will pick that. That's the only way I think of getting right. at the national differentiation. Uh, without this, I think we don't know. Is other than it's an increase and that is good. Does anyone in the um, has anyone in the audience seen exit polls? That's the other way, of course. Yeah. I mean, with all its yeah. exit polls that break it down by adults. I just wanted to say that surveys are not very good for participation because they are highly skewed okay. in terms of who answers surveys about elections. But maybe Geoff knows something better <coughs> about this. Maybe you yeah. can say something about this issue. Election studies, and, and, and typically there is this problem of turnout over presentation. by group, by then obviously you, you would need probably exit polls is the closest you can get to get a sense of what type of photo, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much <coughs> for a tremendous <coughs> array of, of insights. Um, I, I would agree with what seems, seems the general thrust that uh, this breaking of, up of the duopoly um, in the European Parliament um, can actually be helpful uh, for how politics in Europe will evolve in the long run. <clears throat> and I also see a strengthening of the middle ground. And I agree that the coalition formation now uh, will be crucial. But it seems to me that it's more even the informal sort of coalition formation, uh, which might be more important and which might also be better in terms of the political discourse overall. Because uh, if we agree that it's... Uh, more or less a kind of half-half pro or contra integration in the European Parliament. It also matters a lot to go down to the issue-specific um, positions for that. And um, one can show, and we have done that in Vienna in a study that's forthcoming now in the Journal of Common Market Studies, that actually if you go to the positions of the populist radical right parties on EU policies, so that is the specific issues being debated and decided in the European Parliament, if you do that, it is a very big diversity we are seeing. And now that can be made a strength of uh, pro-integration lines and coalitions, but it needs to be done. And it also means more of a discourse, more of variation, more of negotiations to try to get individual of those parties in, in the camp. If you look, for example, at the internal market, some of the populist right parties are very much for more market making and others are completely against it. And it will matter also on a general level to show to the broader public how diverse that camp actually is because that will make an impact. Now it's very often that the media go, oh, the populist right, and, and this is made into a huge thing that is maybe overdoing and is in itself dangerous in the long run. So to sum this up, 
I believe it is of crucial importance how the pro-integration parties behave, or maybe better said, how the parties in the middle field behave. And here we come to an important issue that these parties are also torn between the sides of the new cleavage. And here is something where, particularly coming from Austria maybe, I should stress uh, it is of crucial importance to see what these parties will be doing, and also that in terms of the political discourse, actually there is more offered to the broader public yeah, than always the kind of nitty-gritty party politics ongoing thing. And this explains, by the way, why the Ibiza scandal hasn't made more impact. Uh, it has been mentioned on the panel. So for those who are not so much into it, uh, this is something um, basically about a leaning towards corruption of, um, of the Austrian Freedom Party or some, some of its leaders. And clearly it could have made much more of an impact had not Austrian politics almost immediately turned to the issue of whether to bring down the chancellor, yes or no, and if mainstream politicians had made it much more of a topic, what is actually behind that scandal, what are the values yeah, that, um, that have been shown and what should be the values in political life, things like that uh, would have made for the electorate to see much better what is really ongoing. So to end, it's also about the narratives uh, politicians are giving in their day-to-day -day statements. It is so important, and I think we as political scientists maybe should also think about it, what, what can sort of be offered yeah, in terms of um, pressing the system more towards, towards uh, these, these kinds of taking the debate about values seriously and taking the debate about Europe seriously, not immediately going to the nitty-gritty and also in the European Parliament. Thank you. Um, so thanks to everyone for a very interesting set of presentations and for the data. I wanted to react with a couple of points and then ask a question. So first, in terms of the question about increasing participation, I'm not a scientist, but empirically, I would say that uh, the polarization has helped because uh, we mentioned the fact that, again, there has been this, uh, what was supposed to be a self-fulfilling prophecy uh, that uh, uh, sovereignist uh, nationalist parties would carry the day, and this may have brought more people to the ballot box because uh, they wanted to react to that, and indeed we have seen, again, in certain countries, the rise of the Greens, for example. Um, and, and secondly, also, uh, in, in this respect, I think it was Elias, but I may be wrong, who said something about this election still being focusing on national issues and uh, national dimension playing a role. I think there, first, uh, the two main issues have been, once again, migration, although it's been less salient than was expected to be, and the green climate change thing, which are both transnational and, again, which have had the transnational impact. So I think that is... Uh, changing as well and I mean in Italy we have heard uh, Salvini uh, making this a referendum about him and getting a mandate to go and change Europe so it's the, the, the dynamics between the national dimension and the uh, European one I think are uh, in the process of changing uh, and, and in that respect uh, sorry final point also what is interesting speaking about the cleavage um, Hans Peter used the word uh, cosmopolitan I think what is interesting, especially if you talk about um, Italy and Belgium, it's uh, 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 metropolitan. It's really cities versus rural areas and even seat inner cities versus the periphery, which is in itself adding to the problem because then you have this <laughs> uh, conflict in within the same uh, geographical area. Um, there also the, the, the Lega, like the um, Flemish nationalists, have been very effective on social media. Actually, they claim, the Lega claim that their beast, as it is known, has been the one that won them the election. Um, but finally, sorry uh, for being so long, my actual question is about the other elephant in the room, which is Brexit. Someone mentioned it at the beginning. But here, my question is um, about the impact of a potential Brexit on the power balance between the groups because 
Again, ALDE has, what, 16 representatives from the Lib Dems, uh, Labour also. I mean, certain groups tend to uh, take a bigger blow if Brexit happens than the others, and this may play a role also in the current negotiations. I would like to say something about uh, events and long-term trends. <laughs> Uh, based on, on the Austrian example, but also based on the Belgian example. This event of the Ibiza scandal did not have a big impact on the vote. It had a big impact on government and government formation, on the elite, but the structural conflict <coughs> underlying the success of this party was not affected at all. So what you call cleavage, what I, I, I was more cautious, I said conflict, but I also think cleavage, we think very much the same. Yeah. So uh, the, the cleavage is a, is a conflict which is structural, it's uh, consciously perceived, and it's politically organized in a stable long-term fashion. And I think this is not changing. Take the Flams Belang. I thought the Flams Belang was dead. But it, 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 I mean, it was replaced. I always ask my Belgian colleagues, the NVR, is that not something like the Flams Belang? And everybody said, no, oh, the, the NVR is a much more uh, uh, moderate party and so forth. But now you see the, the, the conflict does not go away and the Flams Belang does not go away. It comes back and it is to be expected that these kind of parties become stable, institutionalized elements of our party systems. And to the extent that we are right and this <coughs> conflict between cosmopolitans and nationalists or whatever we want to call them becomes the structuring conflict of European party systems, to that extent these parties will grow. The Greens on the one hand, the social liberals and the Greens on the one hand, and, and the nationalists and the arch conservatives on the other hand, and I think, I mean, the, the, the story Elias told about Southern Europe was a bit a different story. This, to some extent, the story we tell is, a, is an Austrian, Belgian, uh, German story, and a Scandinavian story, and in Southern Europe, maybe you, you want to add something. Charming, I'll just keep it quiet. Um, there was actually a sort of video, it was actually a, a TV program in the fall in Belgium that exposed um, a, a support group close to, affiliated to the Flams Belang, not technically part of Flams Belang, um, a, a group of young men mostly with uttering racist statements, um, denigrating women, um, I mean, anything else. It, it, it put, a, it, it caused a whole scandal and a mobilization on the, on the other side. But it, and I agree with Hans Peter, I'm just confirming this. To the extent that the, the conflict is structural, the voters who made up their mind on where they stand on those structural issues push these little things aside, like videos and programs. To ask questions. Um, I did, first of all, I totally agree with the long story. I, th I totally agree with the long, pi the, 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 the long term picture that, that there is a new cleavage, and this cleavage, you can call it liberals versus conservatives, you can call it educated and uneducated, you can call it cosmopolitans, uh, nationalists, or regardless how you call it, it is there, and, it, and it, let's call it a value based realignment. Uh, I'm, I'm totally happy with that. The, the way I think that European election, however, is interesting in structuring party competition is in a, in, a, in a less long-term but more mid-term kind of fashion that I think, I'm a bit obsessed with this, but, but I think it provides signals that help voters coordinate. For example, in Spain, we have the opposite trend precisely because elections preceded the European election gave the signal that this is now the party that we go if we are left-wing. If we are left-wing, we now go back to SOE. We are not going to Podemos. And that is corroborated by the... By the by the elections in Italy, the previous election gave a clear, not a very clear, but some sort of signal that this is now the new right-wing party. 
Everyone who lives in this country knows that the leader of that party embraced completely this, this vision, and the AP election helps to show, provide a signal and help this coordination take place. And that, I think, is a more midterm effect, but an interesting effect of the election itself on the national arena. So, for example, Germany the same. In Germany, you, there has been a signal out there that if you are left-wing, you are now probably going to go for the Greens. Not necessarily because it's structural, but now because there is some organization. Also in Austria, I think, in other countries. In other words, there, is, there are sides. There is left, there is right. The left can be having economic or value-based content. You, I, I'm totally ignorant about that, and I, I, I'm happy to take any view on this. But, but within those sides, there is some coordination needed because between different competitors, and the AP is helping in this. something about the very crucial point of narratives. Uh, I totally agree that narratives are important. In particular, if we take into account, for example, the way uh, populist parties uh, uh, communicate their position on Europe. Uh, let's take the Lega. If you, there is a, a differentiation of level. If you look at the party manifesto, something is said. If you go to national <coughs> campaigning, uh, well, uh, uh, Salvini used to say, that Italy should go away from, uh, from the European Union. Then you go down uh, or up to the European elections uh, and you see how Salvini describes uh, the importance of Europe uh, as Europe of the nations. Uh, it's a long story of populist party, Europe of the peoples. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, uh, and last but not least, the political behavior. Uh, and the political behavior even uh, in the uh, in kind of behavior that these political parties belonging to the populist uh, uh, family have within each other. It won't be an easy cooperation. Uh, it has never been an easy cooperation. Uh, the creation of a, a populist, of a right, uh, extreme right, uh, call it as, uh, as, uh, as you want, uh, a group uh, at European uh, level was never easy. And also from this point of view that you mentioned, uh, the economic, uh, the economic uh, uh, recipes. Uh, more liberal from one side, uh, more protectionist from the other side. So from this point of view, the narratives uh, gain uh, uh, crucial importance. Thank you. Anton first and then Doc. Yes, I'd like to come back a little bit on, on this, this issue of uh, once there were cleavages, then there were parties, and now we see party fragmentation, and we redefine them as, uh, as cleavages. Because, I mean, the way Bridget started with, you know, there's a lot of good news, uh, you know, high turnout, you know, a little bit of more healthy politics at the Brussels level. We're going to see this in the representation of the, of the, of the leaders. So all pretty good news. And then later in the discussion, we start to create this deep cleavage that is somehow burning uh, there. But if we look at you know, the, the main parties, uh, um, uh, um, uh, the, the social democrats have become more liberal. Christian democrats have become more social, I would say. Uh, the Greens have always been pro-welfare. Um, and, and even the liberals are less orthodox neoliberal uh, today. So, so in this, this, this group, w which we sometimes think about, you know, this is all about the winners of globalization. This, I mean, this is a very large group, group, and it's not only about the winners of globalization. Moreover, they care about the losers of uh, 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 globalization. So if this strong coalition is able to get together, and I think this is, there are signs uh, of that, um, you know, we're looking at a different kind of Europe that will also uh, put, you know, the pure nationalists uh, um, even more on the defensive. Do so. Um, I said I will not bring in Hungary now, although, although, no, I just, but it's a, I thought it's a footnote, and in many ways it's a footnote, but it's a, I would not underestimate the capacity of the far right, and I call them far right and not populist, um, to cooperate with each other. And recently there was a fascinating article in the Financial Times how long it took the EPP uh, uh, to actually become a cohesive force. And everybody was going in all kinds of directions because you have the Hungarians and you have the most moderate, probably Irish or whatever, and they basically, it was a big political work to bring them together as a coherent fraction, uh, which can then become influential. And there is now a will in Hungary, 
I mention it anyway, and in Italy, and in a couple of other countries to do the same, and I would just not underestimate it. So I would not say because they are nationalists, they cannot cooperate. They can, they do, and they can cooperate, and they will cooperate. Take a reaction to it. No doubt. I mean, if we are right, this will be a, a coalition in, in the European Parliament, which, which will be more powerful than it used to be. But because, what I said before, they have very different uh, ideas and interests, the lowest common denominator will be relatively moderate, I would predict. Because the, otherwise, the, the, they overlap, not in the extremes. They have to put water into their wine to get a common position as the others as well, and I think in this case that will have a moderating effect on them. So I'm relatively optimistic. Just a quick yeah, follow-up on this, and, and you know, it's probably this. Can you uh, oh. elaborate a bit more on what they disagree on? I mean, the, because it, there is Russia, obviously, but, but beyond. I mean, uh, immigration... Ma migration is, is a key issue. But now, Salvini <laughs> wants the, the migrants to be distributed across Europe, and, and Orban doesn't want they one want single migrant. They all want them out. They all want them out, and actually there was, when, when, uh, when Salvini was in Hungary, uh, they, they blended that out. They said, yeah, we don't care. I mean, Salvini, because Orban said, I don't take your migrants, and Salvini said, fine, we don't care so much who takes our migrants, we just want to get them out, and that's the common denominator. It's very simple. When the FPÖ was still in government, uh, the, 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 uh, the position of the FPÖ, uh, uh, like helping uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the Italian government when they had problem in creating and, uh, and having the budget agreed, uh, they did not help at all. They did not support uh, the, 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 the league uh, when they were in trouble with uh, approving the budget. So, so the, this was the official position, at least, uh, of the FPO. It did not, it did not help the, the, the Lega. This is another, uh, another side that has, has to be taken into account. Can I just say that I think one should pay some attention to what will happen, not between the far right and the rest of the EP, but within the, the, the non-far-right section, what will happen on trade? I think there'll be yeah, very yeah, interesting yeah, dynamics between the Greens and, and the others on, on trade. Yet to unfold, but I think it will, I think it will be. Quick question on, 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 uh, on the policy advice tools. Do we have any, I mean, okay, it's early to get data on this, but do we have information about how they could have played into participation rates, uh, whether there is a skew towards who's using these. I mean, I mean since, since you gave an anecdote, let me also give an anecdote. I was struck that my younger son, who was voting for the first time for the European Parliament, I mean, to me, these were fun tools to kind of double check where your thinking is. And suddenly I see an 18-year-old who does it and then goes and votes exactly as it told him to do so. And, you know, in a good direction, may I add, <laughs> which was very good. But, you know, so you could have, is, is it transitioning into something which is more substantial and therefore can it be seen in a different way than we used Take to see it before? Off. Yeah, yeah, I mean. I say something on, on, on the VAs. Uh, one thing is the reliability of the VAA saying that if you use it, then and you reply to the 22 statements, it shows exactly the, the party that you want to vote for, especially if you're a rational voter, so you want to vote for the parties that in their program have issues that you care for and your position. Another thing is to consider that the data that we get for VAA, from VAAs are representative, because they are not. Because people who use the VAA tend to be, in general, more educated, more technologically advanced, uh, and uh, familiar and also more male in respect to women. So the sample is completely unrepresentative. And if at the end of the, of the VAA, you also want to get some social demographic data from the VAA, you have to ask for the consent 
and those people have to say, yes, we want to improve your research, and we tell you how old am I, how educated am I, and so on and so forth. So you kind of have a double selection bias. So it's a subsample of a subsample. So it's really hard to you know, get uh, valuable uh, information from this, kind of, from this side of the VAA. Uh, on the other hand, what is very valuable from this kind of endeavor is the, the data set that we create from the party side. Because right now, for the, with the VAA that we have done for the third time after the UPREFAR in 2009 and UNDAN 2014, <coughs> we have a data set of 272 political parties coded by 133 coders spread all around Europe uh, on these 22 <coughs> statements. And each of the statements is coded, researched, and validated by an empirical uh, uh, source. So on the party side, uh, it's a super reliable and useful data set that can be used also for scholar research for those who are interested in party system, political parties, and party competition. From the user side, uh, also the experience of 2014 shows that there is slightly less to be done with this. But again, it's very different from the reliability of the VAA, so showing exactly what people uh, usually want to vote for. I have a follow-up just based on, because uh, that was, have you thought of, maybe you've done it already, of doing an experiment whereby uh, you take, you know, X people who have actually voted and simultaneously they answer VAA and you see whether, whether what they voted corresponds to the VAA or not. Yeah. Can I uh, quickly follow up on this because uh, in, in collaboration with the University of Lucerne, who is the other uh, side of the leadership of this project, we have actually done an experiment for, the, for this round of the VAA. So we have used basically a, uh, you have used a sample with a control uh, sample. So we have uh, two different samples, to one of which we have submitted the, the treatment in a way, which is the VAA. And this is, I mean, this is still ongoing and we'll, uh, we'll work on this. So we have done it. I wanted to say it's a rational decision-making procedure. So if somebody uses it like your son, he actually makes a decision that is close to the <coughs> prescriptions of rational decision-making. And I think in that sense, it improves the type of vote you, you cast. With one exception, though, and that's in, in a way, sort of, if you think of this as a limitation, otherwise it can actually change things. The, the one factor that is not taken into consideration is the size of the party. And that's a very important strategic consideration. You can have 15 parties in there, and they can be extremely close to you as other parties. The machine right now is blind as to the important saliency or trivialness of these parties. And that's, that's something that needs to be to be said. Uh, one last thing also about the experiment. We, in the very first EU profiler that was that started here by Alex in 2009, I think, we did this little, um, this was one of the very interesting, very not very interesting for the users, but interesting for research um, applications because you wouldn't even get a map, you could get only a name of the party. That's your choice. That's the advice we give you. Now, the advice comes as a result of an algorithm that has continuous proxy of, of, of proximity. So with 79% overlap, you are a party, versus with 78%, you are not. And we ran this discontinuity, and we saw that actually there was a significant effect. The, the party itself became the party that they vote, regard, compared to parties that were also very, very, very close to, uh, to, the, to the user, precisely because that machine used to give you only now. Now it's more difficult to do this type of experiment, precisely because you are given directly the map, the two-dimensional map, so you see all the parties, so you can already assess proximities. Uh, but it, it, it comes with a more general trend towards algorithmization, I would say. You know, that probably will, you know, we, we can, you know, it's machine learning type of thing, so we can maybe create an optimal algorithm to vote. Lorenzo, correct me if I'm wrong, but I have, I have the impression about uh, regarding the use of advice tools uh, that they have been uh, uh, raising in their, uh, uh, in their importance uh, together with the use of other tools uh, like uh, quizzes, online quizzes uh, uh, that are made on newspapers, uh, say your opinion, surveys. These are all tools, uh, in my opinion, that uh, 
uh, have a, a, a final aim that is increasing interest in politics and maybe even a, among younger voters uh, that maybe do not vote as the tool advice says, but it's a kind of circulation uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, ways in which uh, uh, electors can gain or regain interest in politics. Uh, yeah, no, a couple of points. One, um, one about the dimensionality issue, um, and, and, and the other one, in a sense, uh, about um, choice sets and how that influences cleavages. Uh, the dimensionality issue, I thought, you talk about two dimensions, and I think it's probably in a sense empirically true, but what my own work in Britain shows, looking at transitions, say, 2015 and 2017, is that although the second dimension dramatically increases its relevance of vote choice, it's, it's pretty much an artifact of, of specifically Brexit and immigration. Social cultural liberalism and that, and that aspect of the dimension has no increased impact on vote choice and neither should it because the parties didn't run on that sort of issue. And it's not like America where you have abortion and other sorts of things which are fundamentally important. And so and that element of it is like the religion dimension as it were. And, and that's probably not so relevant to understanding future developments amongst minority parties on the right. It's about immigration and, and EU centralized power and not about socio-cultural stuff. Strong correlation between those things at the level of the voter, but the motivational factor of voting isn't about that. And I think this leeway for these um, populist parties to be more or less progressive on those sorts of dimensions, I don't think it's a big issue. So I'd just differentiate that second dimension into Two, only one of which really matters in terms of overtime changes and popularity. Um, and my other point really is about when reading the, the brief for this talk, there was a talk about the rise of nationalism globally, and, and I don't think nationalism's increased really. I mean, it might have done in some countries, but if you look at Britain, and of course I'm British and that's where I tend to generalize from, um, there's always been a you know, dislike of immigrants and, and a nationalist tendency. Um, it's probably less now than it used to be because, after all, globalization has led to an increase in higher education, all sorts of liberalizing tendencies, which you would expect to reduce levels of nationalism. Um, but the problem is, of course, it, whereas in the old days, um, the Labour Party would have represented a fairly protectionist, res reasonably nationalist sort of working class viewpoint. Now it doesn't. So there's a space, and therefore you get parties filling that. So the parties who are nationalist have grown in number. Um, but that's because basically the representation of people with those views has changed and, and declined because of the changing nature of the left. So, so it's not that the population's changed, it's that the representation of their views has changed and that, that's what we're looking at really in terms of changing structural size of, of the potential left-wing vote amongst manual workers has declined, they've shifted to more centrist or professional middle-class educated positions. Uh, and that means these people are just left without anyone to, to express their views within a package of old left and nationalist or anti-immigrant protectionism. And then they've just turned to these newer parties. Um, so they haven't got more nationalist or protectionist. They're just basically expressing that viewpoint differently because of a decline in representation of those views. perils of generalizing from the British case. I mean, I agree that obviously Brexit and immigration is gonna muddy things a bit. And the other thing that muddies uh, the, the waters in terms of general portability from the British case is, is the, high, the extremely high barriers to party creation. I mean, I don't need to tell you that, you know that fully well. Um, it, the, the second dimension, or is it now the first dimension, the Galtan dimension, is, has always been and continues to be diverse. And I actually thought it was narrowing to immigration as the sole issue. But what is interesting is the return of climate change as an issue to disagree about. Uh, I didn't, I, f I forgot to mention it. It was very clear in the flams for lung. So going hand in hand with, um, we don't like these immigrants and we don't like those balloons also, which I didn't even mention, is also the notion that climate change and the kind of policies that are required to contain it are just not welcome. There's a bit of a gilet jaune effect there. When it rains in Paris, it always, you know, rains a bit in Brussels and around it as well. So that's a proximity and that has been imported. But I think there is a more general renaissance 
of the environmental issue, which was the original element that was, you know, very prominent, that actually helped to create that second dimension. Um, I'm, it, it remains a struggle to see that as a single coherent dimension, and I think national variation, there will be national variation in what aspect of it actually goes together, but what, what a cleavage perspective would suggest, while the salience of the components may vary over time and place by place, there is an underlying social structuring there that is pretty similar across a variety of contexts. The, the proof is in the pudding, and we still need a lot more pudding to be made before we're totally sure. Yeah, yeah it, it has always been there, but it has been politicized in different ways, or it has been you said the Labour Party has integrated uh, the nationalist working class into, uh, let's say, left-wing position. But uh, what has happened in continental Europe is that the national, national socialist Labour class uh, has uh, put, the, or for the national socialist Labour class, the national element of the package has become more salient and more decisive for its vote. And the uh, social democrats on the continent have always been cosmopolitan, internationalist, and multicultural. And they have become increasingly so as the new middle class has become dominant in these parties. And to that extent, the national nationalist workers have become homeless and looked for another alternative which was uh, offered by radical populist right parties. To some extent, the socialist element has become less relevant for the vote, and that has something to do with uh, something that somebody already mentioned, namely, I think it was Anton, the convergence of the center left and the center right on the uh, horizontal dimension which I drew on the traditional left-right dimension. So the competition in the party space has shifted from this dimension to the other dimension where the social democrats unfortunately for them have been on the opposite side of what their traditional clientele actually wants. Yes, thank you. Uh, actually, just uh, on this last point that has been made and to confirm what uh, Lisbeth was saying about underlying issues again, with regard to climate change, the uh, common narrative of many parties on the sovereignist side again, including Italy, is uh, climate change is fake, it's uh, Greta Thunberg is a puppet in the hands of the cosmopolitan international, one of the many people on George Soros' uh, uh, payroll. Um, but actually, to connect this to a question that had been put by Jean, uh, in fact, there is data available already at the national level in terms of participation rates by age group, uh, uh, sex, gender, and so on and so forth. Uh, and in this respect, this goes to also the previous point about long-term trends and institutionalization. Um, again, we see a uh, breakdown, for example, in Germany, one of the things that was making the rounds immediately was that in the under 30 age group, the Greens got 33% versus little more than 10% for the CDU, if that is something in terms of the long-term. Same goes for uh, France, but again, Italy in that respect is also uh, an exception because 38% of the 18, 24 year old voted for the Lega uh, even, so <laughs> there is a I'm sorry, just because uh, on the previous point that I forget, I mean, uh, you could say that it's, it's again saying the same thing, but even it's interesting, Vlam's block uh, was um, 
it ended the political arena after being very successful in a municipal election. It's not, it wasn't a European election, but it was a municipal election. It was the, the, the election of Antwerp, in which it got 30%, and that put it on the map as a way of how you know, elections um, coordinate between each other, the, uh, irrespective of the structural elements that, that I totally agree with. brings us to an end and there was a question about executive formation after this in other words who's going to get the who's going to get the offices i think it's important to look carefully at the party composition in the european council the epp is weaker on the council than the combined socialists and liberals i'd pay a lot of attention to that and, and in the european parliament uh, Marco asked the question, well, what about Brexit? Because, for example, Alde en Marche will lose if Brexit goes ahead. But Brexit won't have happened by the time this matters. In other words, the vote on who will be appointed as the Commission President, they will be there. EPP will lose, EPP will lose probably e Fidesz. Uh, EPP will lose Fidesz. Uh, <laughs> so... Uh, my, my only solid conclusion is that Manfred Weber will not be the next president of the European <laughs> Committee. I would, now, as I said, I don't bet, uh, but if I did, I would put 50 euros on it. Is it Margaret Verstagen, or is it Timmermans, or is it somebody Barnier, else? Barnier, or is it whoever. So, I, I, th there are shifting coalitions in the European Council and also in the Parliament. There is a majority available in the Parliament. Very, th so yesterday when the bureau chief, when the heads of the party groupings made their statement in support of the Spitzenkandidaten, they were much more careful than they were the last time when they specifically mentioned Jean Claude Juncker. So it could well be that the president will come from one of the available, so uh, Vestager or Timmermans is not completely out. Barnier, Barnier, in my view, is not completely out, but that would be a break with the Spitzenkandidaten, and the Parliament would think very carefully about that. But then in the European Council, I also, one, uh, I would observe that <coughs> Macron was, m so Macron, when he went into the last European Council on the UK extension, really hammered the table. He he was effectively against everyone. This time he's been whining and dining socialist prime ministers. He's learned his lesson. He's making coalitions. I suspect he will be the kingmaker. I could be completely wrong, but I think he's, he's learned his lesson from his behavior at the last European Council. But it, of course, so what we will see is the bargain will have to be gender, uh, gender, party, and geography, large and small states. So they're the moving pieces in all of this. Will, there be, will two women emerge? That's a big question. There will have to be one, but will there be two? That, that I think, is a big, uh, is a big question. And I, I think, pardon? And, oh, the, the, so the ECB is the reserve game going on to the side because it's under slightly different conditions, but it will be part of the overall package. So it won't actually be specifically mentioned at the European Council like this, but all of the discussions will have been held. So I think, we're, I think uh, Donald Tusk will be spending the next four weeks traveling all over Europe and traveling to the European Parliament. So we'll see a very interesting process. But that's why the ending of the duopoly, in my view, is healthy. It breaks open the politics a bit. Thank you all very Thank much. You. And uh, <laughs>